A very warm welcome to all participants and of course the panelists and moderator and thank you for joining us today. My name is Cedric Wachholz. I had the digital policies and digital transformation section and it's an honor and pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on breaking barriers, navigating gender rights in the judiciary in the era of artificial intelligence. We get together today to come commemorate International Women Judges Day, which was on 10th March. 8th and 10th March are important dates for us at UNESCO, as gender equality is one of the two global priorities of UNESCO. It's a key component of our work. Today's webinar is organized in partnership with Lawyers Hub in Kenya and the Center for Communication Governance, New Delhi in India. And uh, thanks also to, to Pratik and Ikran, Pratik Sibel and Ikran Abdiraman uh, from UNESCO's AI and the Rule of Law program for preparing today's webinar. Now, um, as part of its Global Judges Initiative, UNESCO has already trained over 36,000 judicial operators in over 160 countries on issues related to freedom of expression, access to information, safety of journalists, and also AI and the rule of law. On the topic of AI, judicial actors um, have expressed in interest mainly in two things. One is the use of AI as an administrative and assistive tool in uh, judicial administrations. And the second one relates to the legal implications of AI in societies in general. UNESCO has so far trained over 5,900 judicial actors from over 140 countries on the benefits, uh, challenges, and risks of AI system to support them in their role as of defenders of human rights and fundamental freedoms. These trainings are based on UNESCO's global toolkit um, on AI. Here's an example, and we will find a link also in the chat. Um, a valuable resource for which um, you will find the, the link in the chat, but also um, uh, we use it a lot for our capacity development work. Today's dialogue will highlight uh, the gender bias implications arising really uh, from the use of AI by the judiciary and AI generated content in the dispute, dispute resolution uh, process. Now, um, with the widespread adoption of AI, uh, cases of gender-related bias and discrimination in AI systems are emerging from different fields, from job hiring algorithms to facial recognition systems, and more recently also uh, in generative AI system for image and video productions, and of course, in large language models. For International Women's Day uh, on 8th of March, UNESCO published a study on uh, bias against women and girls in large language models, and we will put a link to that also in the chat. And it is aimed at examining uh, the gender stereotyping in popular generative AI platforms such as ChatGPT uh, 3.5, but also GPT-2 by OpenAI and Llama 2 by Meta, which are open source uh, variations which are a lot um, used across the world. So the study showed uh, that there's a strong bias against women in content generated by each of these large language models. For example, women were described as working in domestic roles far more often than men, um, actually four times as often by one model, and were frequently associated with words like home, family, children, while male names were more linked to business, executive, salary, career. Now, uh, I would like to invite you to get uh, through the study, uh, which we have in the, uh, in the, in the chat, but uh, I would now hand over directly uh, to extend and extend first my thanks and welcome our our panelists uh, of expert composed today of judges, uh, court officials, researchers, and legal pro uh, practitioners from different parts of the world. And we look very much uh, forward to learning more uh, from you. And without further ado, I will hand over the floor to our Honorable Dr. Uh, Dori Reining. 
who will deliver the keynote uh, presentation. And most of you know her, but let me share that Dr. Reling was until recently um, a senior judge at the Amsterdam uh, District Court, and she was also involved in designing uh, the digital procedures in the civil courts in the Netherlands. And she was also a senior judicial reform specialist at the World Bank and IT program manager for the Netherlands uh, judiciary. Uh, she brings also all the qualifications together we need today and holds also regularly lectures on court IT and works in, as an IT advisor to judiciaries around the world. So I look very much forward to your keynote, uh, Dr. Reling, and uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric, very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, to be, be part of this program. Um, it, it really gave me uh, an opportunity to rethink what I've the work I've done so far on AI, uh, mainly, and I'd like to share some of it with you in the coming, let's say, 10, 15 minutes. So I'll share my screen for a presentation. Um, And so here we, this is where we start. Um, it, this is a talk about gender and AI, not necessarily in that order, or maybe the other way around. Um, let's, let's, let me skip this one right away. Yeah, here we are. This is, um, um, move, move my own image a little bit out of the way so I can see the whole slide. Um, the, the picture on the left is, is, uh, has some, some very fond memories. Um, my colleague, uh, Lynn Hammergren, and I uh, did a mission for the World Bank to uh, Egypt about two years ago. And Lynn is talking to three of the um, recently appointed women judges on the Council of State. The president of Egypt had told the Council of State that they should start by hiring women. They'd never done that as judges. And so they hired 100 uh, women judges. And one of the missions that we, Lynn and I had was to explain to the men who were already on the courts what this meant for them. And of course, they were thinking of things like uh, uh, retraining the women and all, and, but we told them that that what the most important thing was that the, they would have to rethink their behavior towards women because they were used to women as servants and now they had to deal with women as colleagues and that's a different ballgame altogether. So, um, that about the picture. I studied law in the, in the 1970s and my uh, civil procedure professor explained that he, he thought women were better judges because they are less confrontation. Uh, you can think, think about yourself and see if that's true. Um, by the end of the 70s, I, uh, I, trained, I, I interviewed to become uh, a, a trainee judge and one person on the committee said, we just had last, last year's uh, uh, statistics and it turns out that we select more women than men. And that's not because we like women better, but because they are better. So the statistics were that they had, had had 100 um, applicants and of the 75 men who applied, they, uh, they, adept, they, they accepted 12. And of the 25 women who uh, applied, they also uh, uh, accepted 12. So that's 50%. Um, but at the time, so then I became a, a, a female trainee judge in 1980, and that was, um, th th again, that, that, that was in the early days. So um, imagine that there is a 15-person court and you are the only woman trainee judge. Um, this means that this is not a, not a time to make gender a big issue because you have to sort of blend in to be accepted. So that's why, especially in the beginning, gender issues were not something that we just talked about much because we had to uh, fit in to be accepted. But today, things are really different. We are, I've, I think we're about 40, year, 40 years on, and by now, the most court presidents are actually women. So things do change. Um, a little more history. I don't have to repeat this one. This is a lovely picture uh, my husband took when, when I was on a mission in, in Africa. Uh, for the uh, for the courts there, so I can easily skip to the next one. So um, uh, on a different tack, one of the things that that I think most of us have done when we started using ChatGPT is to ask what ChatGPT Chat GPT knows about us. So I asked ChatGPT what it knows about me, and it came up with all sorts of things that were correct that you've seen them in my TV, but it also came up with 
awards and recognitions and a publication that I had never seen before and that was certainly not mine. So what can we, the conclusion we can draw from this is that ChatGPT fabulates. We know that by now. Uh, so if you haven't done it for yourself, do it. I mean, I can recommend it. It's very amusing. Um, and it also teaches you to be very careful. So this is another example of something that went completely wrong. Uh, the, the editors at the SCOTUS blog in, uh, in, in Washington asked ChatGPT for three noteworthy opinions by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it came up with some correct ones, but also with one that was completely incorrect. The one on the dissent on Obergefell and Hodges, where in fact she was on the majority. So again, don't trust chat GPT results. Um, we, we tend to, to talk about AI as if we know what it is, but most of us I think have not, uh, not really grasped what, what, what goes on, let's say inside the machine. Uh, uh, think for a second, what, what do you think um, um, a, digital, uh, a, a digital judge would look like? Would it look like uh, the, 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 the creature at the top or would it look like a machine? It's a question, just, just think about it. So what, what, what actually, what, what is AI and, and what, how does it work? It's a simulation of intelligent behavior. And, and in the beginning, we used to think that it would simulate human behavior. But I think the thinking is now changing and that we are looking at intelligent behavior that is that is not human. But what it can do, we know we know most of that. It can recognize speech. There's a, actually, there's subtitling at the bottom of my presentation. It can recognize text. It can recognize images and it do, can do more and more as computing power increases. Um, so we, what what is mostly used at the moment is machine learning. And machine learning is AI for a purpose. So you ask it a question, for instance, what do you know about uh, person X? Um, and must, uh, an algorithm in machine learning can also be trained to do a certain thing correctly. It is used for e-discovery in the U United States and in the United Kingdom. Um, it might be good to have go and have a look at that to see how it actually works and the procedural safeguards around that. And then there is deep learning where the algorithm can actually learn from what you feed it. And this is where it, it, it can learn to play chess and go on its own. So um, now that we know that, yeah, um, this was the next slide exactly. Um, so what it does do, it, it, it recognizes patterns in data. So it, it, it means it can organize text for you. It can do a summary, uh, uh, things like that. It can draw a conclusion from, from the patterns and advise you, for, for instance, to, to take a certain action that looks likely, or it can make a prediction, and that is a, a, a predicting a likely outcome. Uh, I don't have time to go into all that much more, but if you want to read my article, there is, there's more about the predictions there. When AI first started being used for uh, justice systems, the European Commission uh, on, on the Efficiency of Justice developed uh, guidelines. This is the, their ethical charter. Um, I, I had a small role in putting this uh, ethical charter together. And I think it's a very, um, uh, let's say, practical um, uh, tool for understanding what to do and what not to do. So I'll spend a little time on, on some of the principles that underlie the ethical charter and two in particular, one is non-discrimination and the other one is human control over technology. So the next slide is about discrimination. The principle is to prevent discrimination between groups and individuals. Now, what do we mean when we say discrimination. It means that we, that is a distinction that we consider unfair. So that's a normative judgment actually, or it's unfair treat, treatment of different people. Both those, those definitions are about right. And it's being used, for instance, uh, the, 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 the algorithm um, that we're talking about here, it's, um, it's called COMPASS. It's the Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. It is uh, intended to uh, predict the uh, risk of recidivism in criminal cases. So uh, the, the, the reference is at the bottom. 
But the example that I'd like to talk about for a little while is um, the, the two people here. Um, uh, a a middle-aged male called Vernon Prater who gets a low risk from the algorithm. And we have a young woman called Risha Borden who gets a high risk. Um, we know that Vernon was re-offended re fairly quickly and Brescia was never seen again. So why would she get a high risk? Well, probably because she's black, because the algorithm thinks that black people have a high recidivism risk. So um, the, les the lesson here is that, that um, uh, um, the, the data determine the outcome. And if an algorithm is not properly trained on what to do with the data, you get results like this. Uh, this this uh, tool is actually being used by courts in the US and, and they, they, do, they treat it differently. Some ignore it, some uh, select which results they like, others follow it diligently. So um, an example of uh, what, what is actually in use in AI in the courts. So what is the cause for the, for the discrimination that, that is the result of the algorithm? It could be in the algorithm itself. It could not be properly trained. It could be in the programmer who programmers have, they need to have a certain idea of what the function, functionality is of their algorithm. So it may be in the design of the algorithm. It may be because there are not enough data to make, make a, for recognizing patterns, you have to have a certain amount of data in order to be able to be able to find a pattern. And if you don't have enough data, the pattern may be flawed or completely wrong. Um, since for this algorithm, uh, it, it needs data that are the result of the, the application of laws. So it could be that the laws are biased. It could be that judges uh, um, give higher sanctions to black people, it's possible. And that would mean that the judges could be biased. So all of that could be a cause for discrimination that we should, if we can, try to avoid. Uh, another example of what AI found hard to do and also why it was hard. For instance, uh, recognizing black faces in facial recognition, because they, if they are only trained on white faces and you are a, a woman of color and you have to take an exam, and you need, you need to identify yourself by facial recognition and the algorithm doesn't recognize you, you cannot take your exam. This is an example from practice in the Netherlands. The other example is from Google. Uh, Google had a, a, an algorithm for, for uh, recruiting staff and it could not find suitable women. It would not uh, simply find them in, among the, the applicants. And that's because it had been trained on Google staff data and those data were mostly about men. So there it's in the data. And in my other example, it's in the algorithm itself. So principle five, and actually this is my favorite principle, and that is that AI should be under user control. So what does that mean? There's a lot of legalese in the, in the principle itself, but what it means is that the computer should not decide on its own. And users need to know what the AI does and decide what to do with the AI's result. So the AI's result should never automatically be the outcome of your search or whatever it was you were doing. So there's a brief AI for judges. There are lots of, uh, of, of uh, guidance uh, documents coming out right now. This one is from the UK. And uh, for individual judges, the, mo the most important thing is that you understand how the AI works, what it does. And, and understand how the result uh, came, came to be. Be aware of bias and be also aware that your court tribunal users, case parties, lawyers, may have used AI tools. So always, if, um, if you have a sense that, that, that something, something could, not be, could be wrong, check whatever it is they've been saying. There's more in the, in the document that I don't have time to uh, discuss right now. And then, of course, there is an AI to do for courts as well, because courts are, they, they generate data, they produce data, they, if they use algorithms, they are responsible for how the algorithm works. So, judiciaries need to be in charge of the design of their algorithms about uh, in the development, and they have to be sure that the algorithms they use 
are correct and they work correctly. And something else that courts could actually do is to make sure that the legal source input is, is, is improved by making sure that the data are correct, that they are secure, and that there are enough data for algorithms to use. And finally, um, I don't know about your courts, but uh, my courts for a long time have used Word documents and they, they PDF them when they're published, but machine processable judgments, processable judgments would be a great help for us if we want to use AI properly. So that was uh, the, the, the shopping list for courts and judges. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's been fun and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Reling, for that wonderful presentation, which I think um, really sets the stage uh, for the broader discussion we're going to be undertaking today. Um, and I'm sure many of the points that the panelists raise will relate back to uh, some of the key points you raised. I think um, some of my key takeaways from Dr. Eiling's presentation would be that uh, when we're talking about AI and its deployment in courts, we're talking about, uh, sorry, when we're talking about AI and its role within the court system and its impacts, we're talking about it not only at the level of um, within the court system and the way it can maybe bring some efficiencies in decision-making, case management, and of course, there are associated risks, but we're also talking about, um, you know, implications of, you know, say, generative AI and, and the role that this can play in terms of the way evidence gets presented in court. How do you authenticate such um, evidence in the era of, uh, you know, so many different kinds of open source generative AI tools? So we have an excellent lineup of uh, panelists today to further dig into and dissect uh, these questions. And I'm, I'm really excited for an all-star female panel. Um, you know, I, I so enjoy, uh, uh, you know, having the opportunity to moderate one of those. Uh, I'll quickly introduce the panelists. Um, we have Ag Agnerus um, who is a policy analyst at Access Now in Latin America, and she really focuses her work on freedom of speech and expression, digital rights, privacy, and uh, related issues, and has really a lot of deep expertise uh, that she'll bring to the table uh, on this discussion. Uh, we have uh, Jacqueline, uh, who is a commissioner of the Judicial Service Commission in Kenya, and is the regional coordinator at the Kenya, Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights um, and, you know, has, is, has been an advocate of the High Court of Kenya with more than 10 years of experience on women's rights issues. Um, and then we have Ivana, who has joined us um, today as well, um, who is a feminist activist from Argentina and co-founder and uh, executive directress of the first gender data observatory in Latin America uh, called uh, Data Genero. And she's part of the feminist AI network for Latin America. So we're, we're so pleased to have um, all of you with us today. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna uh, sort of open up the discussion um, and you know go with um, Agnaris. Um, I think one of the biggest questions um, which, which remains, um, and it's not new, we know that there's gender bias, uh, you know, even today within the judicial system. Um, and many worry that, you know, the integration of AI systems uh, will exacerbate uh, such gender bias. Um, so, so what 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 do you say to that? Is it that um, you know a lot of people say that hey it's not going to be much worse than it already is, um, but there are others who say you know actually integration of this tech is really going to exacerbate things and um, you know the efficiency that may come with it 
um, the the loss of the level of justice that is delivered, you know, the the hit that you know the justice delivery system will take is just not worth it. So how how would you sort of respond to this uh, argument? Well, first of all, it's important to realize that uh, AI tools are just tools. So they are not aimed to replace the function of judges and all the legal professionals. So taking that into consideration, we need to analyze tools as, as their own nature. We can say that a car is good or bad, or it makes uh, worse something. We can say that internet is good or bad. So we can say that AI tools are either good or bad. The thing is that we need to recognize two important things. The inherent bias that, as you mentioned, already exists between judges and legal professionals, and also that that bias can be translated, transpolated to AI tools, because at the end of the day, those tools are functioning with data collection. And unfortunately, the most of the times, this data has a huge amount of uh, information that is not representative nor balanced and can in haste uh, make deeper this uh, gender situation between this gender discrimination, actually, <laughs> between all the outcomes that they might reach. So the first recommendation or the first argument is recognize the inherent bias. And the second lawyer, uh, yes, the second point is to be aware of the data that it used to train these systems. And this leads me to one of the most important points when we are talking about AI tools, that is transparency. When we talk about transparency, it's not only talk about the algorithm transparency, it's also talk about the transparency of the data that is being used to train these systems and also to realize the main goal or the objectives that these tools are made for. So if we are using a huge uh, AI tool that was launched not for Mexican context, not for Nigerian context, not for European context, well, then the outcome might not be targeted to the cultural, social, and all the legally situation of each of these countries. But also, this might come with few uh, mistakes about uh, minorities and groups that has been discriminated for many differences. And one of them is women and gender related issues. Because the most of the time, this kind of tool don't take into consideration a specific data that must be taken in so many legal situations. Uh, there's a AI system that is being used in Australia that it's known as, as split up. This split up system is used to uh, help the judges to identify the assets to correspond to each of the persons within a marriage. And the most of the time, the elements that are used, as far as I know, they were taking into consideration 94 key elements for a statistical techniques, techniques, sorry. And within these key elements, many of them were not taking into consideration gender related issues. So the most of the time, at least in Mexico, one of the things that must be considered is the time that women put and the effort and the work and the non-paid work that they do within the marriages. Because when you are splitting the assets, well, you need to take that into consideration that the most of the cases, sadly, 
women that have the opportunity to develop professionally and economic and with economical resources to independent to be independent or to gain some of the assets within the marriage so we are already talking about recognizing inner bias we are already talking about the transparency not only with algorithms but also with the data that is being used to train all these systems. So another important part is a regular testing and audit these systems, which is commonly known as making risk assessments. The risk assessment of AI tools, mainly used in the judiciary, must be tested to identify if they are making deeper any bias because the the one of the great things that this tool can do is to help to make uh, the access to justice more efficient and more and quicker but also it makes more probably to have uh, more uh, rates of error and more uh, percentage of making the gender biases bigger because they are working fast. So the faster you work, the more mistakes you can make. And we need to be aware of that. There's any system that is 100% efficient. Every system makes mistakes. So we need to be aware also about that. And that's why the risk assessment and the audits of these systems should be, must be, before implementing these AI systems, during the implementation of these systems, and after the implementation of these systems. So there are three key moments for, being, for doing this risk assessment, not only just once, no. These risk assessments should be done through the whole process of developing, the developing them and implementing them. I, uh, I will make a echo of Dr. Raylin saying that the human oversight remains crucial, which is also something that we know as human in the loop the human in the loop and the revision, the supervision of a person is really, really important. But this person also have to be trained, not only to understand how AI system works, how the specific system that is being used should be functioning, but also this person needs to be trained to identify any potential gender bias. Because if the person don't know or is not aware of the biases about gender and, and other cross-coding issues, then won't be able to supervise and to identify if this system is making or committing mistakes that will be against the human rights of any person. Finally, two important things is as I was mentioning, the education and the training for judges, but also for all the people that is part of the legal staff and also the legal practitioners, because we have seen cases. I know that you know the case of uh, Mr. Mata versus Avianca, where the representatives of Mr. Mata quote fake cases uh, given by ChatGPT. So educating not only judges and legal staff, but also legal practitioners to be aware of the risk of using these massive tools that are not designed and are not helpful at all to make decisions or to make legal arguments. And the worst is to let them make those decisions of that arguments without any supervision. So everything you need to check and verify. Finally, the public awareness and feedback mechanism, because even if it's an in-house tool that is developed by the, some authority 
judicial authority or if it is a public tool, the feedback mechanism will help to let the people report any situation that might lead to violation of human rights. One of them, discrimination, and as I was mentioning, gender bias, it sadly remains one of the main situations and one of the main things that create differences in any social context. I will put a Mexican example that uh, is not related with the use of AI tools, but it is related with the administration of justice and the differences between being a woman or being a man. As you may know, we have many problems with uh, organized crime and we have really, really poor communities where there are no men in those communities. Men weren't migrate to some other country to look for better job opportunities. But at the end of the day, and the most of the time, they forget about their families. Sisters, mothers, daughters, the women remain in those poverty situations and the organized crime use them to sell drugs. They fall into the need to sustain their families and sustain themselves but sadly the government despite that knows this situation this contextual situation decides that the higher rates of sanctions criminal sanctions goes to this kind of women that have uh, children that have families that, that uh, have many cultural contextual situations that make them fall into that uh, condition to be selling drugs. And the huge difference is that uh, the severity of the sanctions vis-a-vis -vis the men uh, that commit the same kind of uh, crimes is less punitive and uh, face less challenge. One of the main challenges is also the uh, gender bias torture that is targeted specifically to these women. So the most of times also these women face and a specific kind of torture by the uh, authorities. This context is awful because if you are going to generate AI tools that will be, if be feeding by this data, well, the data is biased at all, at all. And it will have a reach an outcome that will be awful for women in these cases and criminal cases might lead to one of the bigger risks that is uh, the privation of the uh, physical liberty. So uh, I will end there to, to share uh, uh, some other ideas with my colleagues, but uh, really, really happy to keep digging into these issues. Thank you so much. Um, picking up from a couple of points that Agnes has made and moving to Ivana, um, I want to some, you know, uh, towards the beginning of uh, Agnelis's comments, uh, what she sort of alluded to is the fact that um, there has to be sensitivity within the judiciary around the deployment of AI tools and the impact it can have on gender. So I think one is sensitivity. I think the second is how do you ensure ethical deployment of tools in, in the sense that the tools that are deployed are actually robust and trained on, you know, good data sets. Because, you know, Agnes was talking that, you know, if currently there's already gender bias in the judicial system and um, AI systems are trained on these flawed data sets, then you're going to end up with flawed decision making even, you know, by this AI system itself. So, um, you know, you've sort of been um, uh, involved with iMore AI uh, in terms of um, within uh, the Argentinian context, looking at it. Um, and, you know, it's been, a, it's an interesting tool that's been developed to address the lack of data on gender-based violence cases within the Argentinian judicial system. And I know it's sort of been built out from there further. 
Um, and the idea has been to, you know, ensure greater accountability and transparency within the judiciary when it comes to gender-based violence. So I guess more broadly, how would you talk about gender-based sensitivity and building that within the judiciary? And how do we ensure, um, you know, good data practices when it comes to deployment of AI systems and, and the training of uh, these systems? Uh, we, uh, your voice is cutting out, Ivana. Uh, we still can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. We Perfect. Can. Sorry, Thanks. I am uh, at the hotel. So <laughs> this is happening while I'm traveling for different reasons. Um, I will speak from my cell phone if, it, if that's okay. And tell me if the connection cuts at some point. Um, well, I am Ivan. I'm the founder of an organization called Data Genero. We are really worried about the lack of gender data to measure the ODS number five, that is gender equality. We don't have the data that we need to measure inequalities in many places. The criminal courts is one of those places too, are one of those places too. And I am not a fan of AI. That's the first thing I want to say. I am. I don't have that fetish of using AI for everything. I, I, I am not okay with that. And one of our biggest projects is to make the society sensitive about the issues and dangers of AI. But on November 2021, uh, a group of people approached us and said, if if we have funding to create AI from a feminist per perspective, would you be okay to present a project? And we said, okay, because unfortunately, most of the funding nowadays for working with data is for working with AI, not data, because data is not sexy anymore, AI is. So we are kind of being distracted by it and not be putting funding into what really matters to solve societal issues. I don't think that the AI will solve, solve issues as big as, for example, gender-based violence or poverty or hunger. Uh, I think it's just a distraction and there is a lot of money into that distraction. That being said, we got the funding to create an AI with feminist methodologies of design and that's what we did because we want to show that it's possible and it's not about who has the biggest model or the biggest computing power. Uh, it's about building things in a sensitive and curated way. So that's what we did with our project called Aimurai. Aimurai means harvest in Quechua. We want to harvest data to understand gender inequalities. And we had the luck of working with a criminal court whose judge is really an ally. Uh, his name is Pablo Casas, and he opened the doors of the criminal court and the data for us to uh, implement this simple AI. But it wasn't simple at all because we had to tackle a lot of issues to do it in an ethical and secure way because this is people's uh, privacy and security. So everything was done inside the criminal court. So we had to label data, we have to we have we had to train the models inside computers and not use cloud services. For example, we didn't use Amazon Web Services, we didn't use Google or whatever. We had to train it in our computers with the processing power of computers offline. So the information never touched the cloud, never left the criminal courts. And I think that is important because. If we don't take those precautions, we are giving a lot of sensitive information to big corporations, and we don't know in the future what they can do with that. So we had to trade accuracy in our models for security and privacy. So our models are not the best. They are not working as ChatGPT, for example. They are not identifying 100% of the fields we want them to identify. 
but it's 22%, uh, 92%, sorry. So it's fairly good. And our AI is not predicting anything. Uh, like we don't want uh, AI to decide on people's lives. I think that's uh, the job for humans and teams, not one on per person only, teams. So our AI just identifies relevant information in criminal court rulings. So we can create data sets and we can anonymize the rulings to upload them. So we are helping to build more transparency in criminal courts, specifically in Argentina, criminal courts are not very transparent and we don't have a, le a legislation comp compelling them to open the information. So we are starting with a few criminal courts that are willing to use this AI locally, offline, to read the documents, to identify the relevant information to put in data sets, and then to anonymize the documents and put it online. So very simple task, but if a human has to do it, it takes a lot of time and it's almost like it, it has many errors. So it's better to semi-automate it. And that's the point I want to make because Dr. Dory Railing said it, we don't we don't want the AI to make decisions by itself. We always add a step of human validation so humans can check that everything the AI detected is correct and it should be uploaded, but we are never, never leaving the chance, you know? So uh, th this is the way we decided to do it. We decided not to use big LLMs, not, not GPT or, or Llama or Gemini, not, none of that. We build a custom algorithm and our development is open source. Everyone can see the code. Of course, they can't see the training data because it's really sensitive, but we have synthetic data that people can see that is similar, but it has fake information. And um, we, we decided also that it should be implemented in the computers. So no uh, internet connection will be needed because in Argentina, most of the computers don't have the best internet or the best processing power. And also we had some decisions regarding the interface, the, the UI of the, of the software that should be clean and should be like uh, blended into the office pack that a criminal court officials use. So we had a lot of design decisions, but everything is of, uh, online and you can take a look at the code and the decisions we made we wrote a paper and we're writing another one on this implementation. And that's one of our main uh, projects. And we are really looking forward for feedback and to implement it in Latin America. Thank you so much, uh, Ivana. Um, Jacqueline, uh, if I can turn to you, um, you, you know, we, we'd really value your perspective from, where you sit within the Judicial Com Commission of uh, Kenya. And are you seeing the development of use cases of AI either within the Kenyan judicial context or in, in the broader region? Um, and and how, would you, how would you look at the deployment of um, AI systems um, and its impact on promoting gender equality in adjudication? Or are there certain risks that you also see that uh, you know come with the deployment of uh, such systems? Okay, thank you, Kaka. And uh, happy International Women's Judges Day to the judges who, are, who have joined us uh, from across the world. And I wish to also congratulate the women judges who've been appointed in their respective countries. They have managed to break the glass ceiling. So the Judicial Service Commission of Kenya is a constitutional commission whose mandate is to promote the facilitation of the independence of the judiciary and its accountability. And at the same time, it's expected to ensure that uh, the judiciary is efficient and is run in a transparent manner. So among the things we do is recruit judges, train, uh, organize training programs for judges, development and uh, monitoring of various policies, and review budgets. Listening to Dr. Dori, he mentioned uh, she mentioned about the situation in Egypt. Just allow me in half a second to give you the statistics in Kenya with regards to. 
the women judges. We have a female chief justice, a female deputy chief justice at the Supreme Court, 43% of the judges are women. At the Court of Appeal, 41% are female. At the High Court and Courts of Equal Status, we have 46% of uh, female. And uh, at the magistrate level, we have 47% of women. So 57, sorry, not 47, 57% of women. So this shows that uh, Kenya is a trade setter when it comes to employing more women into the judiciary. So we need to celebrate the women judges and magistrates in Kenya and across the world. So in Kenya, since uh, COVID-19 came, we have had an accelerated uptake of ICT at the judiciary. So in 2020, the judiciary launched what is called the electronic filing system, but commonly known as e-filing. So this system allows litigants to access court by filing online uh, documents and uh, internally the court has something called the case tracking system. The case tracking system is an automated case registration system where you find uh, issues around fee assessment, cost list preparation, generation of orders and performance reports. So that has really helped uh, the judiciary in terms of managing and monitoring the performance and the uptake of judicial services. And uh, last week, that was uh, 11th of March, uh, we had a nationwide launch of the e-filing system. And as a country, all courts, you are able to access all courts by a click of a button. And I must commend the judicial officers, the judicial staff who are able to develop these systems. It was a homegrown systems. So we have not engaged or uh, used AI systems as other countries. I know there are some countries that use AI in uh, bail application, but uh, for Kenya, we have started pilot projects. Last year, the Judicial Service Commission approved the setting up of the National Trans Transcription Center. And uh, the same year, within November, they set up a pilot transcription project within Nairobi. So as at November 2023 and February 2024, we had a total number of one of 951 transcriptions submitted. And out of the, the trans, transcripts that were submitted, we had 12,050 pages that was developed. So the accuracy level of this particular system is at 94%. So we have also developed the speech to text application under Microsoft 365. So where judges are, uh, can dictate and uh, then the speech is converted into text. Again, this is a pilot project and uh, we will roll out once we have identified the pros and cons of these two systems. So these two systems have been effective in, in the administration of justice. And uh, we have women, we have men, uh, intersex persons access, accessing the courts. And once you have this system on board, it is easy then to have your cases heard and determined fast. So the e-filing system has seen expedited resolution of, just, of justice and women too have benefited from this partic particular program. I am aware that Tanzania too has uh, come up with uh, AI for transcription and translation, and translation is strictly with, between English and Swahili uh, languages. Not within the context of administration of justice, our Kenyan judiciary website, we have uh, the deep fake, the AI generated portals. If you create time, you can, uh, have a look at it. And I was just having a discussion with the director ICT. If you look at the photos, it's uh, very key for the discussions you're having here. When you look at uh, the development of, because we have specialized SGBV codes. So when you click on the button of SGBV codes, you will find women photos. So that then tells us that these systems are generated with algorithm that have certain biases because men too, suffer from gender-based violence. At the same time, if you were to click on the access alternative justice system, 
where we use cultural structures to ensure that uh, people, especially in far-flung areas and at the community level, are able to access justice. If you look at the photo that is there, it will show you that it is men who are sitting under a tree adjudica adjudicate adjudicating cases. And we are all aware that in certain parts of the country, we have women too who adjudicate cases. So these are just few examples that I would uh, want to highlight in terms of uh, AI-generated photos, the bias that is under the algorithms. So our laws also allow the use of electronic evidence and uh, courts are expected to review the evidence in accordance to what the law provides. But with the uh, issue of uh, deep, deep fake coming up, there is a challenge. So the courts are yet to know how do you then deal with with the uh, AI generated photos, especially when you want to confirm the authentic authenticity of uh, the said document. So unlike other jurisdictions, as I'd mentioned earlier, where you find some courts using AI apps to write judgments, our Kenyan courts, the judges continue to use their minds and they can just do research based on uh, the case law they would want to use but ultimately the decision is from the particular judge and this has to be protected because we have to protect the decisional independence of a judge or a judicial officer. So in as much as we've not done quite a lot like other jurisdictions in terms of uh, using AI in adjudication of cases, we have put in place certain measures because we are growing and there's been increased uptake of ICT at the judiciary. We have, uh, as a Judicial Service Commission, approved the data policy. Uh, we approved the same last year. And among the guiding principle for that data policy or anything we would want to, to use that is linked to data or uh, ICT, the guiding principle include accountability. So we've undertaken to Kenyans that anything that we'll do will be accountable to them. It will be, uh, there is the aspect of openness, transparency, and confidentiality. confidentiality. So we are very big on issues of uh, data protection. So we also have a gender and a diversity policy. Uh, Whereas well, this was adopted a while ago, but what this policy seeks to do is to ensure that anything the judiciary does any program, any project, any system must have the gender and diversity lenses. So that's uh, uh, something that uh, we have done as a Judicial Service Commission. We also have a code of conduct, which is applicable to judges, magistrates, uh, and judicial staff. So our ICT officers, any person who uh, would uh, access uh, personal information, among the things that the code of conduct calls for is to promote confidentiality. Uh, in addition, we have the Kenya Judicial Academy, which is uh, supported directly by the Judicial Service Commission. And for this financial year, we did approve a training calendar. And among the topics we, had, we have selected for the Kenya Judicial Academy in consultation with the uh, the magistrates and judges and the and the directorate is training on cyber security and deep fake evidence and how judges should be in a position to identify some of these new and emerging issues on AI. And uh, litigants are allowed to review transcriptions. So if you make the necessary application and you're a party to a case, you can always make the application and, and uh, you would then be in a position to review the transcriptions uh, as I mentioned earlier. So yes, uh, in terms of way forward, AI is inevitable. Listening to the speakers who gave their views and uh, their experiences, we may not really run away from AI. And uh, we need to put in place the necessary mechanisms to ensure that we promote gender equality. 
And looking at Kenya as a country, we are patriarchal, where there is an equal power distribution, there is uh, incidences of gender violence, gender discrimination. So with this embedded unequal power, there is a likelihood that, likelihood that AI systems that are set up could have these existing societal biases. And uh, I'm happy to just uh, learn from Dr. Dori, Agneris, and Ivana, just trying to highlight what are some of the things judiciaries should do in order to promote gender equality and address the negative impact of gender inequalities, inequalities within the justice sector. So issues of uh, training and education for judges, that one has been mentioned. The issue of transparency and accountability, a diversity and inclusion in the tech development. As I mentioned earlier, uh, most of our, our systems are homegrown. We, we have the directorate developing this system. So we need to ensure that, for example, in Kenya, we need to ensure that the gender and uh, diversity policy is implemented when developing these uh, techs. And then we also need to collaborate with experts and uh, policymakers. The role of the judiciary is to adjudicate over disputes. So we cannot be said to be the experts on issues of AI. So we need to engage with the relevant experts and the policymakers within the judiciary. Community awareness was mentioned. I don't want to repeat that. And be flexible. And uh, because we are still developing, I think there has to be closer collaboration with partners within Kenya, uh, Africa, and, and uh, internationally. Otherwise, thank you so much for this uh, great day. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up uh, some questions from the questions that po uh, have been posed by the audience in the Q&A. Uh, you know, some of our panelists have been kind enough to answer them in text, but it may be good to um, perhaps uh, dive into some of them and, and have some of our panelists uh, share thoughts um, um, during uh, the you know the conversation part of our discussion, what I will request the panelists to do is um, to we'll try to do maybe two rounds uh, of questions across the panelists, and uh, we have about twenty minutes left before we need to start uh, wrapping up. So what I will request is um, if each panelist can keep their responses limited to about two, two and a half minutes. Uh, it'll give us a chance to pick up uh, maybe five or six questions uh, before uh, we have to end the webinar. Um, so, um, you know, one of the uh, questions that um, sort of comes out over here, which I think uh, links well to uh, Agnes's work at Access Now is, you know, at Access Now, I think you'll have been looking at some case studies around uh, judiciaries mitigating gender bias, um, you know, in AI systems. And, you know, there are some outcomes and learnings from there. Um, and I think this uh, links um, very well with uh, Mohammed Shoaib's uh, sort of question that they have posed that if there are instances of judicial systems using AI for judging and deciding of cases of a complicated nature and how such systems are taking care of gender sensitivity and uh, responsible bias, uh, responsible AI. So I guess the question is within, say, the Latin American or the broader global context, if you're looking at case studies around gender bias and AI systems, what are really lessons and outcomes that you have seen? I will probably talk about a specific case that is happening, is still happening, but it's about to reach a final decision in Brazil. In Brazil, there's a lawsuit uh, between IDEC, the is the Brazilian Consumer Institute, then it 
that case is against Via 4. Via 4 is a company that uh, it's in charge to manage somehow the line yellow or line four of the subway in Sao Paulo. But this company start using a automated gender recognition tools in order to deploy targeted advertisement based on the gender identification of the people. The thing is that the most of the time we see as innovative and we think that the techno solutionist will uh, lead us to better outcomes. But the truth is that if we are not aware of the potential dangers of implementing any sort of tools, the harms to human rights would be really, really problematic. What happened with this automated recognition of gender tools in the subway of Brazil is that they start making gender biases. They start making uh, predictions about people by the way they look. And the worst thing is that they start implementing this tool specific without the consent of the subword riders. So we have two main problems here. One of them is the lack of consent for the treatment of sensitive data, such as the way you look, the way you walk, and based on that uh, physical assumptions, they start dividing the people between male and female and start uh, releasing targeted advertisement. IDEC, that is a human rights organization focused on consumer protection, uh, identified this problem and start a lawsuit against the company. The first instance judge, which is also a women judge, realized that this was committing, this situation was creating and perpetuating biases among them, gender biases, and also gender against LGBT community, because in Brazil is recognized the uh, rights of trans people, which might not identify even as male or female, but also, well, the uh, rights of this community. Thus, the first instance uh, ruling identify this situation and uh, first of all, they make a stop immediately the use of these kind of technologies. And in a second instance, the company appeal and they lose again. And the fine was rise to 50,000 reals, which reais, that it's the coin in Brazil. And the thing is that despite the ruling can be appealed one last time, the trend is that this company will be sanctioned because they are committing not one, but several violations to human rights of the riders of uh, the subway in Sao Paulo. But this case is also very appealing because it's facing Clearly, the gender bias in a specific issue where these technologies are being deployed, even without the consent of the people. In another case that is related to gender, well, sorry, to bias, not specifically with gender, but it's a racial bias, is the case of Francisco Arteaga versus the state of New Jersey, with a Latino man was pointed out by a facial recognition tool implemented by the state of New Jersey as the one that commit a felony uh, against a shop. And because of that, he is facing challenge against his personal liberty because he was identified by a technology that is not transparent, that uh, lacks of uh, information about, about the 
rate of error. And that make a, or that points out that the use of these tools by the authorities will be very harmful, not, uh, will be very harmful for many people, vulnerable communities. And among those communities, we can face and we can identify that women might challenge these situations. And there's a really, really nice study that I recommend that it's called Gender Shades, Intersectional Accuracy Disparities in Commercial Gender Classification. And the study found that the AGR system deployed by many companies had higher error rates for women than men. And the failure rate was even higher for dark skinned women. So there are already studies, there are already cases that we need to take into consideration while considering the implementation and the use of these AI tools. And um, I will be more than happy to share this with you guys, but I will also share the word with my colleagues. Thank you, Agnes. Um, Ivana, coming to you, uh, John Burgess has a question around the use of AI as a case management assistant tool, assistant tool and how that distinguishes from um, using AI in aiding judicial authorities in actually reaching a decision. Um, and uh, their view is that the use of AI in tracking of cases uh, and you know uh, case management uh, systems could ensure unbiased flow of cases within the system and, and hence enhance gender parity. Um, so I guess in this context of this question, how do you envision the role of AI assisted judiciary, um, both at a decision making level as well as a broader case management uh, sort of uh, level and, and, you know, how does this re relate to broader questions of gender equality? And if you can keep your response to two or three minutes. Perfect. Can you hear me okay now? Perfect. So, um, I, as I said before, I am not okay with using AI for decision making or uh, replacing people or, help, or helping people. Uh, I am really conservative in this issue because we don't know the extent of the bias. We don't understand it fully and it can appear in different layers and different levels. So, my opinion is we can use AI to help in administrative processes and to help manage some things because it's really useful for that and it has, has proven that it's kind of safe. I, I won't put my hands on the fire for this, but it's safe uh, to use for administrative purposes uh, in the case that we are not uh, using it with big companies. Again, uh, it's we need to mind the privacy of the data, the privacy of the users, and that it's something that, that people in criminal court, criminal court officials can use easily. We don't want to complicate their lives either, and it will create a rejection of, of tech. So we need to do it in a, like, start slowly and, and putting these systems uh, and training the people to use it in a safe way. Um, but for me, it's really problematic, uh, the decision-making. Uh, as all the speakers spoke about this, and I, I think that I agree with that. I think we should be very careful and we should audit all the technology that comes into criminal courts. There should be teams auditing the, the technology and trying to break it and to decipher what's behind it and the biases. It's really important. And if the technology doesn't comply with the ethical rules that, for example, UNESCO drafted about AI, uh, it should be removed or fined. So we need to be strict about this. Uh, that's my opinion, and I'm happy to see what everyone thinks about this. Thank you, Ivana. Um, um, uh, Jacqueline, um, Sanji in the chat Q&A has said that it's clear that more training is needed for judges and other judicial officers on AI and, you know, AI is looking very attractive and it looks like judicial workload can be lessened. 
um so you know as part of your role in the judicial commission um what strategies have you all been toying with to put into place to enhance the capacity of the judiciary um around engaging with ai ethical use of ai navigating questions of ai that may come up um in cases before them and um you know you you gave us some examples of the kind of digitization you are seeing um in kenyan courts but how can countries that perhaps are at nascent stages of ai adoption say within your region um you know how should they be thinking about the risks of ai adoption as well as leveraging some of the benefits so you know how do they create a balance over here because while it looks very tempting that judicial workload will be lessened there are also inherent risks that you know ivana and agnes have been talking about um and you know at the uh, in the objective of becoming more efficient we don't want to lose the very heart of a justice system which is to ensure uh, the delivery of uh, you know fair and just uh, decision okay uh, thank you thank you for the question uh, allow me to also mention that on issues around case management we are using decision support systems so they are in place but they are not ai ai uh, they are not uh, ai uh, system. So we we use them to support in recruitment, to understand the caseload, to understand the number of judges we need to recruit, the areas with the high uh, number of cases, the number of judicial officers we need to send to a particular station. So it's more like assisting us to come up with the decisions around administration of justice. But when it comes to actual decision making, this requires the judge or the magistrate to give their feelings though in as much as they say there is no feeling in the decision writing but you can tell when you read a judgment you can tell the feeling of a judge so it requires decisional independence of a judge the judge must be independent as opposed to having algorithms that have been fed with the information that you're not sure about used to make the decision so as a country for now decisional independence is strictly are made by uh, the, the decisions of, of uh, the court decisions are made by judges and magistrates in person, but they can use the decision support systems for research and every other thing. So the most uh, controversial or the most difficult bit for judges, as I said earlier, on issues around AI is uh, majorly on production of electronic evidence. So if you look at uh, uh, the training calendar for, for this year, the judiciary has been deliberate in including that particular aspect of evidence analysis. So we are working with other state agencies uh, to ensure that our judges get the necessary support and information that is needed. At the same time, all the applications that we have, majority of these applications that we have, I say they're homegrown and the judicial officers who have developed these systems are then bound by our code of conduct. And our suppliers also, we expect them to sign the confidentiality agreement. So we have put in place systems that uh, will ensure we do protect uh, the Kenyans or other persons who are accessing our, our court systems. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, now we're close to coming to the time to conclude. So before I hand back to uh, Pratik uh, to um, you know conclude, I did want to uh, ask the panelists to do a round of what you know in, quickly in in maybe thirty seconds what they want the audience to really reflect on um, after this conversation. And, and really internalize uh, based on the issue that we have been discussing. And perhaps I'll um, shake things up and ask Ivana to uh, go first, um, to you know, just give a 30 second quick bite of, of what the audience should be thinking about and taking away. 
Yes, I think one. I think one. Sorry. We've yeah. lost you, okay. Anna. Ah, okay. Yes. Um, so one main thing is that we don't use we, we don't need to use AI for everything. Sometimes the things that we want to use are tech based, but not AI. Uh, so not AI first. That's uh, <laughs> sorry, but I'm really like fed up with uh, with this AI thing. And I think it has a lot of potential, but it's not the only way to go when we want to innovate and to create change in places. It's one of the ways to go and it should be complemented with a lot of different things. So if we want to use AI, you should also hire people that can audit and can test this before using it. And that should go for big tech too. They should test everything before releasing it into the society. And we don't want to be the test bunnies in, in, in their developments. Uh, but yes, be slow, careful, and sensitive and ethical. Thank you, Ivana. Um, uh, Jacqueline, uh, it, you know, what would be your uh, guidance to the audience? Okay, uh, thank you. My guidance to the audience would be that uh, behind AI, there is a human. And behind that human, there is a societal context. And if I'm to speak for Kenya, a context where there is a patriarchy, where there is a unequal, uh, an equal uh, power balance, and where there is discrimination. So we need to find ways of ensuring that that bias does not get into the AI system. And I would agree with Ivana on issues of the de decision making. We need to, for some time, I don't know whether we will hold it up to what time, but I think the decision making process in terms of the actual decision writing of a judge or a judicial officer must not go the IA way because that will then interfere with the decisional independence of a judge. Someone else will have created the algorithms and that will not be the actual decision of a judge who has taken oath of office to promote the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Agnes, uh, your closing thoughts for the audience. Uh, I will say that I'm agree with what my colleagues have said so far and also raise awareness and the importance of uh, take into consideration human rights. Because if we understand how AI tools work and we link them with all the knowledge that you already have as legal practitioners on human rights, then you can identify any harm to them, either on gender discrimination or from expression issues or privacy. So always, always look up or thinking about using Agnes, we seem to have lost you. Uh, oh. right there. Now, now you, you got me? Yeah. No, just, just to say. Sorry, we seem to have lost you again. AI tools should remain a key aspect. No way. Well, Please be aware of uh, respecting, protecting, and uh, taking into consideration human rights while using AI tools. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ryling, if uh, you have any closing thoughts you would like to share with the audience. Well, this, I think we've, we've been trying to cover an enormous field of, uh, of, of issues around AI, around uh, judiciaries, around human rights. Uh, but there's some, something that I'd, I'd like to highlight, um, and that is uh, about the relationship between AI and efficiency. Uh, we easily say, uh, tend to say, oh yeah, AI will make the judiciary more efficient. Well, 
I'm afraid that that is very seductive for, let's say, ministries of justice who are funding judiciaries to say, okay, we now we have AI, we can reduce the number of judges, or as they do in China, we can control our judges with the AI that we develop for them. Um, so let's let's be careful about uh, saying, okay, uh, courts need to be more efficient. Courts need to deliver justice. Um, and that is not the same as being efficient. And for the past 20 years, MOJs the world over have tried to economize on, on court systems. And let's face it, they are expensive because most of the work is done by people who have to be paid, but it's because they are delivering justice and we have to keep doing that. I'm in charge of a project right now where we try and understand how technology can actually support uh, uh, enhancing, uh, uh, delivering justice values like access or fairness and fairness. So keep in mind that when someone brings up efficiency, you want to be really careful. And thank you for a great conversation. I've had a wonderful afternoon and I wish all of you lots of success in your work because you really deserve it. Thank you so much, Dr. Island, and thank you to our audience for um, the engaging Q&A that they've kept up. Uh, and I'll hand back to Pratik uh, to close out the conversation. Thank you so much, Alak, uh, for the excellent facilitation. And thanks to the panelists for the very rich conversation. Um, I would just like to uh, share with all the participants that this is just one of the dialogues that we are having this year. And specifically, um, we, in the African context, we are going to have three more dialogues on AI and gender. And uh, these will go on for the next three months and you will uh, be receiving the invitations. And for the global participants, we will also continue our series next month with a more deep dive into criminal law. And then uh, towards September on AI and elections. And finally, we will come back to use cases of AI in the judiciary to also emphasize how it is already being used in the sense of improving efficiency. I think we, we do need to consider that there are risks, but there are also great potential to use AI uh, for the benefit. And we will be showcasing some examples from around the world. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinars. The recording of this session will be sent to everyone who registered. And we'll also share the invitations for the future webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you.